Okay, I'm going to start out with Merle's job, so be it. If I can find my stuff. Okay, what did I do with it? Maybe it's in here somewhere. I got a Bible instead of a phone today, too. Did you see that? Some of you are like, yeah. I don't know what I did with my Bible verses. No, it's not on my phone. It's on a piece of paper. Do I have two pieces together? I'm sorry. This one has Barry's name written on it, pulled out of the hymnal. But that's not it. That's the COVID guidelines. That's the other. That's not it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have anything written down. That's scary. Here it is. I'm going to go ahead and start. Get this out of the way. Okay. First it was you. Now it's you. Okay. Debbie, come by the shop. And this tells you about the apprehension that we don't know that we have and stuff and where you need to be careful of other people. Sherry went and hugged you, right? Sherry went and hugged Debbie, and then after that, maybe I shouldn't have done that because you don't know how Debbie felt about it. She was okay with it, don't get me wrong, but you don't know those things. So take that. You don't know who has immune deficiencies or anything else. Think of others before you think of yourself, right? I think you've heard that somewhere before. Okay, but then Debbie proceeded to say, what did you do to your head? You can hear her. Did you put a bow on it? So last night while, um, before I took a shower, Sherry was cutting my hair in the bathroom. That took a lot of faith, a lot of faith. And she even said it. She said, you are so anal about your hair and everything. But I let her cut it. Now you... <laughs> Okay, here's our scripture reading for this morning. These are from the ESV. John 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Ephesians 5, 8. For at one time we, you were darkness, but now you are light. In the Lord walk as children of light. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5. For you, are, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And Matthew 5.14-16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Most of those verses are familiar to you, and you kind of might get an idea of what the lamp is for at this point. If you've been reading along, we read through Kim all the way through Matthew before we met again. Because she put a post, I hope we don't get all the way through Matthew before we meet again. We got, we got through James and Matthew, and we have started the book of Romans. Romans is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He didn't establish that church. It's different than the other churches. This church was established by people who heard the message and then went back to their hometowns. Peter or James hadn't been there. None of the twelve apostles or, or Paul had been there. This was believers taking the light to the world and a church in Rome started. And they were living in a relatively free time of not Christian persecution where they could be the light of the world. And Paul writes this letter to them. Who would have known that just years later they would be burned in the streets as human torches, as lamps for their faith? And Paul writes this letter to them. It's a letter of what we should believe, why we are so wretched because of the sin that we have committed. 
that God is the only way of salvation, that He loves us so much that if it wasn't for Him in the world, there would be nothing but darkness. And then it goes on to tell you how you should live a life filled with the Spirit, a life that glorifies God. The only reason that you are alive and created is because God created you, He loves you, and the only reason that you are redeemed if you believe in Jesus Christ is because He loved you and poured His grace upon grace upon grace on you. So why in the world would we not worship a God who loves us that much? Paul begins his message to the Romans by vividly portraying the sinfulness of all people, explaining how, to for, how forgiveness is available through faith in Christ alone, and showing what believers experience in life through their new life of faith. In this section, we learn of the centrality of faith to becoming a Christian and then living the Christian life. Apart from faith, we have no hope in life, only darkness. So you started out reading in Romans chapter 1 about Paul is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of salvation. You and I cannot be ashamed of God. We cannot be ashamed to be called Christians. We cannot live a life as a light to the world. I've got to plug it in first. Consider this the conduit to the Holy Spirit. How's that? and it barely reaches. We can't be the light to the world if we walk around like this. Can't do it. Others won't see our good works. They won't glorify our Father in heaven. They can't see our light if it is diffused, if it's turned off. We won't shine. We won't bring glory to God there won't be a church that develops in Rome. There won't be people that are saved from the persecution that comes their way if we don't light the way. Jesus left this world and left us to shine. In this Bible that some of you got... <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32, there's a header that says, God's anger at sin. So I'm starting in verse 18. But God showed His anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because He has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything that God has made, they clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. You cannot look at this world and not see order instead of chaos. You can't, cannot look at this world and not see design. You cannot look at this world and not see a God who loves you that would create all these things. Even from your sense of feeling, of not being able to touch one another. Taste buds. Taste buds always just blow me away. No evolutionist can explain taste buds. Why when we eat food, mm, we can taste that. And there, there's so many. And the more that we put that flavor around in our mouth, the more that it explodes. Why? Because God loves us and wants us to have pleasure. But pleasure in the Creator, not in the creation. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they would not worship Him as God or even give Him thanks. <laughs> Today I got up and I wanted a sunny day for church and it's raining. <laughs> what the heck? Do we complain and grumble? Paul had to write about that when he said, Remember, when God's children who were rescued from Egypt complained and grumbled about what they first called bread from heaven and then they said we're tired of this same old garbage boy have I seen that in what we're doing right now I really want to go out somewhere to eat and the restaurant's packed the first day there's no social distancing you sure they're going to try and I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody 
it's all because, and did I want to go? Yeah. All because I want to go do what I want to go do. It's been too long since somebody waited on me. I'm tired of cooking my own and cleaning up my own. Thank you, Lord, that we have a place to go out to. Thank you, Lord, that we have food in the first place. Thank you that I have oxygen to breathe. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. I don't have any idols. I don't have any statues that I pray to or burn incense on. Oh, Christian, you have so many idols in your life, especially in this world filled with so many of them. Verse 24, So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile things, vile and degrading things with each other's body. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of all eternal praise. And then if your scriptures there, you're following in, there's an amen. Okay? That means you agree. Okay? I'm going to skip down to 28 just because I'm not going to focus on homosexuality because that's what so many of this verse people focus on in these verses. <laughs> You're going to miss the point again if you do that. We're going to talk about another passage in just a minute that if you focus on something, you're going to miss the point. Verse 28, Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never, ever be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder. I know none of y'all have done those things. But what about quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip? Mm. I, I love that part where prayer requests are just gossip. Don't ever let them be that. Prayer requests are so... i tell you one, one thing that when you guys said your prayer requests, I felt like my life was better than I thought before. And I focused, went on praying for you instead of praying for the crap in my life. We need one another. We need to lift each other up. We need to be here together worshiping God, not gossiping or slandering, not concerned about how the service is going to be or this or that, not in it, but putting our focus on worshiping God. What a great thing that we're able to do today to put our focus on that. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. Now this one just cracks me up. They invent new ways of sinning. What, what in the world does that mean? And they're disobedient to their parents. Whoa! But if you think about that, what's the fifth commandment? Honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with relationships to one another. The, others, first, the first four are about God and your relationship to Him. And then your first relationship beyond that should be that you have a good relationship with your family, especially, especially the mother and father that God gave you, regardless of whether they're a good mother or father or not. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to honor them, to put weight on them, to value them, because they are your mother or father, and God gave them to you. If you don't do that, oh yeah, you can't. how can you have a good relationship with anyone else? And if you can't love your brother or sister who you see, feel, and touch, how can you ever love God that you don't? They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them also. Now remember, I'd remind you this 
all the time, this letter was continuous. It was a letter that Paul wrote to the, this church, this body of believers in Rome, who he had never been there, he didn't have a personal relationship with. They only knew of him through gossip, through whatever. And he's writing this letter that starts off this way, but it, remember it started first with, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because that's what he's presenting here. But he's writing all this, and here's the point. Chapter 2, verse 1. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. There's your point of Paul's writing. You, O Christian, who gossip and slander, and my point is not to point fingers at you today. If anyone hears a sermon that God puts in my head, heart, mouth, it is me because it convicts me when I read His Word. It's a sharp, two-edged sword. It cuts in and it cuts when it pulls out. And that's its purpose. It is living. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You, Alan, may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. You have no excuse. Verse 4. Here's another point to make now that I've realized that. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can you see that this, His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Why? So others can see the light in you. So they can be drawn to God, not see your hypocrisy, not see your sins, your selfishness. Yeah, I'm a sinner, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a sinner and a hypocrite saved by grace. Don't fix your eyes on me, I'll let you down. Don't look for me for all the answers, but I will help shepherd you as Christ shepherds me, and it helps when you help me just the same, because I am just a human being also. And it's my, not my job to go out and be the only light in the world. It's your job to walk with me, to sometimes let your light shine brighter when mine's not shining as bright. That's why we're together. That's why we each have spiritual gifts. That's why we are the body. One is a hand, one is a foot, one is a spleen. Whatever God has called you to be. And even the things that we don't put as much thought into are just as vital. You know that as you get older and some of these organs not, don't work as well. You think how vital they are to the function of the body. I just wish I could get through the night without getting up three times to go pee. <laughs> but oh well. But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they've done. Not according to faith here. Faith saves you. But once you're saved, this is your job. He will judge everyone for everything, every thought that you've done while you breathe on this earth. We didn't read this from Matthew. This parable you won't find there. It's only in Luke. In Luke 15, Jesus tells a parable about a lost son. He tells this ser series of parables about what was lost, what was found, and the rejoicing that was there. Okay? Starting in verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons... The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his two sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all, the money, all of his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his, into his fields to feed the pigs. 
The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of his servants what was going on. Your brother is sick. Oh, sick, I'm sorry. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never, wa never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time you never gave me one of, even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when, his, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I, ha I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now is found. I don't like this parable even be called the parable of the lost son. It's, in my opinion, the parable of the gracious, gracious, gracious Father. We all tend, though, to see ourselves as one of the other sons. We should all see ourselves as both sons because we've all done things that were very disrespectful to the Father. We've all done things where we've complained and been bitter and moaned. We've all done things, as Christians even, where we've shut out some of that light. And it was never intended to be that way. Regardless of your sin and shame, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're free. You're cleansed from all unrighteousness. You have eternal hope and security in heaven. You owe God everything plus everything. And Jesus simply says, deny yourself, take up your cross, whatever that is, and follow after me. But we want to complain. We want to groan. And people see it. Don't think they don't. And we waste so much of the light that He's given us. For however many years we have the light. Oh, if we didn't do that, if we just let our light shine. Our Father in heaven, who this definitely is about, loves us beyond anything we could imagine. I have one son. I don't have two sons. I have one. And I thought about this when I went over this parable again this week. What if he said to me, I hate you. I want my inheritance. The only thing I do want is your money, nothing else. I thought about the parable of the rich man that said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what would be that thing that would make me walk away that day sad? Because it wasn't about selling everything he had. It was what is keeping me from God. Whether it's a disobedient son, whether it's the lust of life, whether it's the fears that you have, 
Whatever it is that's keeping you from God and keeping you from letting your light shine. Because there is going to be a day that it won't shine anymore. Because you will not be breathing. You will either be dead or Jesus will have returned. And you will be judged for everything that you have done in this body. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. I have to be honest. If my child, not saying that he didn't have two, think about it, that makes things worse. He had one son that said, I want you dead. All I want is your money. And he had another son that said, I'm just working here for what I can get because I don't love you. Neither one of them loved their father. Neither one of them were committed to their father, but their father was committed to them. Yes, I need to put myself in both sons' places because I am that child, both of them. And my father has loved me unconditionally. When he should have got fed up and said, I'm done with you. Instead, he said, I love you that much more, you hypocrite and liar. I love you, Alan. I love you, Alan. I love you, Alan. No matter what you do, I'm going to still love you. No matter how much you curse my name, how much you are a hypocrite, whatever it is, I love you. And when Jesus started his teaching in Matthew, the first teachings early on, he said, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So if your best friend, if your mate, if your child, I don't care who it is, says, I hate you. I want you dead. Are you going to love them unconditionally? Are you going to give them whatever? And I'm not meaning literally do it, but maybe I am. Was Jesus literal when he said, when your enemy asks you for your jacket, you got a Merle's got it. Do we have several people got jackets on? Polly does too. When they ask you for your jacket, are you going to take your shirt off also? Polly, if you take your jacket and your shirt off, what are you going to be right here? Not pretty. <laughs> Was he serious? Was Jesus serious? He was serious when he went to the cross. And he didn't say a word when people accused him, when his friends denied him everything else. He was that perfect father because he is the perfect representation of the father because he is God. He even cried out to God the Father, take this cup from me. Then he cried out, why have you, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did all of that because how much he loves you. I'll be honest with you. It wouldn't matter if it's my son or not. If Polly again, I'm using you today, sorry. Jacob's not here to point fingers at. If Polly said, I hate you, I just want a check for $5,000. I'd say, go fly a kite. <laughs> and then I'd be like, that ungrateful. What? That's what I would do. But that's the exact opposite of what I should do. Because Jesus took all of this away. Probably can't get it off now. <laughs> he said, I have taken all of this from you. And, and you will have eternal life. Go shine. Go shine for me. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise your holy name. Lord, help us to get to where we worship you and there are no distractions. Father, we thank you that we're able to come together, that we can worship you. Oh God, you are a gracious, holy, righteous God that deserves all praise, glory, and honor. There's a world that needs to see it and you've given us a huge responsibility. And you've even given us your spirit to carry us all the way through, to carry us all the way home. Your spirit is crying out that we belong to you and we can come to you and cry out, Daddy, because we know that we have that personal relationship with you. 
And we know that Christ is standing there interceding for us as well. Lord, help us to shine. Help us to be a light to one another and a light to the world. Help us not to gossip or moan or complain. Lord, we thank you and praise you for being that perfect Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget your offerings. Don't forget.